Well, good evening and welcome to our Bible study, both in person and online. Uh, today we are going to begin uh, looking at uh, Isaiah chapter 6. And uh, the, our kind of our subtitle for today's lesson is um, <clears throat> being shaped in the form of what we worship. And if we worship things of stone, as, as Isaiah will talk about, things that aren't real, stone and wood and metal, then we become like what we worship. We become like the things that cannot see and cannot hear and cannot feel. Ooh, Isaiah chapter begin looking six. at Isaiah chapter 6. And what I'd like to do is I'm using a thesis from a book um, by G.K. Beale, and it's called um, We Become What We Worship, A Biblical Theology of Idolatry. And his the book, the focus is Isaiah chapter 6 is kind of a thesis of what we're worshiped. And his thesis is we become like what we worship. If we worship God, we become like God. But if we worship other things, we become like the thing we worship. Um, and he uses Isaiah 6 as kind of a starting point, looking at all of Isaiah and then looking outside of Isaiah as well. We'll start with Isaiah 6, and it's a familiar passage. Most of y'all have heard this passage, and I'd like to offer some maybe some things uh, to way of uh, thinking about it differently. But if you've got your Bible or if you just want to listen along. So Isaiah um, is called um, and... His call story in many ways comes out of this vision in Isaiah 6. Um, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty. And the hem of His robe filled the temple, and seraphs were in attendance above Him. Each had six wings, and they had two covered their faces, and two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. And the seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say this to the people. So, so far we have this image that Isaiah sees uh, God sitting on a throne uh, in all of God's glory. And Isaiah um, recognizes as he's in God's presence that he, just like his people, are unworthy. And it's only after an act of God, the coals on the lips, that He is made clean. And He is to go back to this unclean people, His people, God's people, the covenant people of Israel, to go back to them and to announce God's Word. And notice what He is told. Go and say to this people, keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes so that they may not look with their ears and listen with their, look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. Then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is utterly desolate. Until the Lord sends everyone far away, and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Even if a tenth part remain in it, it should be burned again, like a terabith of an oak whose stump remains standing when it is failed. The holy seed is its stump. It's a curious passage that Bill uses 
as kind of a, a, a starting off point to the idea of idolatry in uh, the Old Testament and moving to the New Testament and contemporary today. Because it's the call story of Isaiah to go out and preach a message to, uh, to Israel. And if you, you know much about the Isaiah passage, Isaiah is during this period uh, of, of pre-exilic, exilic, and post-exilic. So if you read the story of First and Second King, well, starting with First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, you see the story of Israel's history as they go from tribal Israel under the judges, after right before First Samuel, to kingship, to monarchy, to a divided kingdom, and to the end of Second Kings, where they're carted off the, the southern kingdom of Judah. Northern kingdoms already fall into the Assyrians. And the question is, why? Why has all this happened? And they go back and they hear the story of the prophets, what the prophets have been saying, whether it's Isaiah or Jeremiah or several of the other ones that are contemporary to them. And much of them will say it is because you have either worshipped other gods or in your worship you have chosen to focus on other things like power and greed. And oftentimes idolatry and power and greed kind of go hand in hand. So Isaiah is called to go out to a people to tell them what God wants them to hear with the awareness is when, when, when he goes, they're going to listen, but they're not going to comprehend. They're going to look, but they're not going to see. And their minds are just going to be dull. So Beale, in his, in his book, he opens up this question, why would God send somebody to go speak to a people if they're not going to listen and hear? And the question is, maybe it's that they won't listen or hear. Maybe it's they can't. And if they can't listen and hear, why? What has happened to them? I'd like for you to turn over to Isaiah 44. And uh, I want us to, to look... Um, and Isaiah, if you read all of Isaiah, you'll see over and over again this issue of idolatry that comes in and out of it. But uh, Isaiah 44 is often a, a, a good place to, to look at Isaiah's um, understanding of, of what idolatry is. And then we'll look also at Psalm 115. All who make idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know. And so they will be put to shame. Who would fashion a god or cast an image that can do no good? Look, all its devotees shall be put to shame. The artisans too are merely human. Let them all assemble, let them stand up, let them be terrified. They shall all be put to shame. The ironsmith fashions it and works it over coals shaping it with hammers, forging it with strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches a line, marks it out with a stylish, fashions it with planes, marks it with a compass. He makes it into a human form with beauty to be set up in a shrine. He cuts down cedars or chooses a holm tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar, and the rain nourishes it. Then it can be used as fuel. And part of it he takes and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. And then he makes a god and worships it. Makes it into a carved image and bows down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire, and the other half he roasts his meat upon and eats it and is satisfied. He also warms himself and says, Ah! I am warm. I can feel the fire. The rest of it he makes into a god, his idol. He bows down to it. He worships it. He prays to it. And he says, Save me, for you are my God. They do not know, nor do they comprehend. Their eyes are shut, so they cannot see, and their minds as well, so they cannot understand. No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, half of it I burned in the fire, I also baked bread on its coals, I roasted meat and have eaten, now shall I make the rest of it into an abomination. 
Shall I fall down before a block of wood? And he feeds on ashes. A deluded mind has led him astray. And he cannot save himself or say, Is not this thing in my right hand a fraud? So Isaiah 44 is a polemic against the idols in that the absurdity for a Jewish understanding of idols is the God who has created the world, everything in it, and the very thing that God has created you take and use for fuel, and you also use it and worship it. Now for us, uh, in a first century world, not many of us understand idols in the way that the ancient world did. I mean, how many of y'all have any idols in your house? No? 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 I don't, I don't either. We may, but we don't have it in this way. So one of the things that uh, in the ancient world they would do would be they would craft an image of something. And, and last week we had some some representations, some figurines. And whether it was for a temple or whether it was for a, a community or a household, once you crafted it, one of the things they would do would be to invite the deity it represented to somehow endow its spirit within the actual idol itself. And then they would offer sacrifices, if it was a large temple, if it was in a home temple, they might would offer food and prayers, hoping that by doing that, they somehow satisfy the deity it represented for themselves. Now, most, whether it was Egypt, whether it was the Canaanites, whether it was the Assyrians, the Babylonians, every neighbor Israel had did this. So you, you can imagine Israel is not living in um, an isolated box. They live amongst people and with people. And the temptation is if you marry somebody outside of Israel, if you live outside of the homeland and move back and forth, however it happens, even if you are taken into exile, you know, many of those in the northern kingdom were taken to Assyria, to Nineveh. And you are around people that do these things, the temptation is to be like what? To be like them. Some thought they could worship both. Some within Israel were doing it. And the question becomes, well, one, why is it so bad? But two, how is it shape and form you? The question becomes, why is it so bad? Well, one of the reasons was oftentimes the idols, the gods, were always somehow associated with the other empire. Whether it's the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians. And they had a different narrative and a different story of what the world was like. And when you worshipped them, guess what? You became like them. Not just the idea of becoming like the, the physical structure of a piece of wood, but you became like them in, in seeing the world the way that they liked it. You know, you think about, uh, how many of y'all have ever lived outside the U United States? Here. Okay. How many of y'all lived outside of South Carolina for a while? Okay, yeah. Um, when you go somewhere, over time you start to become a little bit like that. I mean, for good or bad. My sister, uh, she moved away for several years. She, she moved to Maryland. She came back, and her kids grew up around us, but they would say things that just weren't things I heard in Shelby. Like, you guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did, I, we didn't say that, but she, she, she caught like some of the vernacular and it got mixed in with their vernacular and, and they would say stuff that was just, you know, where did that come from, you know? Um, what about when you've gone somewhere, you went to, and, and, and visited Spain? What were some of the things when you left there, you were like, I wish I could take that with me? Uh, siestas. Siestas. Casual coffee. Yeah. Yeah. When you go somewhere else or you're 
inundated with somebody else's culture, you start to look at it and start to think, there are some positive things here. Well, Israel, oftentimes religion and the state or the empire or the economy were all mixed together. As Baptists, we like to separate our politics and our religion. But in the ancient world, everything's tied together. When you go to Jerusalem, where Isaiah ends up, where Jeremiah ends up, and you speak to those in power, everything's connected. The temple, the throne, and the economy. One of the things Jeremiah and the other prophets would say is, you know, right before Sabbath, you're already thinking, the day God has commanded you to rest, you're already thinking, how can you make more money when you get back? But not only how can you make more money, how can you oppress the poor to get more money? These were the very things that God liberated them out of Pharaoh, who said he was a god. So the thing that you worship, whatever the ideas are, you become like them. Turn over to Psalm 115 if you've, if you've got your Bible. And let's read that. And then I want to talk a little, little bit uh, about a few things and then we'll, we'll kind of open it up for a little bit of discussion. Psalm 115. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. The idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not feel. Feet, but they do not walk. They make no sound in their throats. Those who make them are like them. So are all who trust in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel and bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. And you can continue to read the rest of Psalm 115. Psalm 115, like Isaiah um, 44 is an awareness within Israel is that when they look at those that worship other gods, the question becomes, worship is formative. You know, we think about, you know, how, do we, how are we shaped and formed in life? You know, think about how are you shaped and formed to be the person you are? Well, the things that you put your time and energy and your trust in, your loyalty in, you ask that thing to take over you in some way and shape and form you. You know, um, if you go to the military, you give permission to the military to reshape and reform you. David, is that true? Do you get a whole lot of say so? No. no. Um, if you give yourself over to your job, and it becomes the thing that you give yourself over to. It, shape, it can shape and form you, for good or bad. Hey, Ken. I had a phone call. I stayed on too long. You're okay. Um, you know, if you're around certain people for too long, for good or bad, you become what? Like them. Yeah. Um, Anything we spend our time, our energy, our concentration, our hearts on, it will shape and form us. And for Israel, if they give their allegiance, if they give their worship, if they give all that they are, you know, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, um, worship the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul. 
That's what worship is. You give your whole self over to God. It's more than singing songs. It's more than coming to church on Sunday. It is a total giving over. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. You either love the one and hate the other. Israel couldn't love God and love worshiping these other idols. Because eventually you become like what you worship. Or you hate the one and love the other. If the one promises you security, <clears throat> prominence, but the question becomes, how do you get what you want? In the Egyptian mold, Pharaoh modeled for his people, it's about production. It's about more. It's about bigger. As soon as Israel gets out of Egypt, they become uncomfortable with this mysterious God who's liberated them. And when Moses is gone, what do they do? They want something comfortable again. They want an idol to worship. We talked some about that last week. One of the other issues within the text here is we didn't read, we read Genesis 1, but we didn't read Genesis 2, the second creation story. And in that second creation story, if you've got Genesis 2, just flip over there. So the Genesis 1 story is a story um, where the Hebrews tell the story of creation and it's, it's told in this seven-day creation story where God creates everything in, in an orderly place, where everything has a place. I read one commentary said it's, it's like God built a house, and the first couple of days God builds the house itself, and then the rest of it God furnishes the house, and then God rests. In some ways, if we talked about creation in and of itself, in, in the Hebrew understanding, was the temple. And we were made in the image of God to reflect God to what? The world. In the Genesis 2 creation story, there's this beautiful understanding of God in terms of the formation of man. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished in chapter 2. And then in, in verse 5, it starts, so it starts a, a, another uh, creation story. In that day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens... And when no plant and field was yet in the earth, no herb in the field had yet sprung, for the Lord had not caused it to rain upon the earth, there was no one to till the ground. But a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. In this passage, Israel understands that we as human beings... Not those idols that are what? Empty. They have no life. They cannot hear. They cannot see. Here God has shaped and formed human out of what? The dirt. And God has breathed into us life. The Hebraic understanding of the, of the world, the cosmos, was that we as human beings were the representation of God into the world. We were God's image to the world. Now sin comes along and mars that image. It takes the image of God and it makes it into a parody of something else. And part of what sin does is to try to control the very creation that God gives us by doing something outside of the life that God wants us to live. One of the very interesting uh, parts that Bill talks about is in the ancient world, um, we talked a little bit about it, but um, there was a thing called um, a mouth or a lip ceremony in the ancient Near East and also in Egypt. And what it was in Egypt was when a person died, they actually had tools that they would do in a ceremony, which would be to open the mouth up and try to recreate life for it before they buried it. So that they would go into their burial, into the afterlife. They also did it with their idols. And what they did is they had a ceremony to which they would take um, these graven images and try to uh, shape them in such a way and then bring life to them. So let me read a little bit from Beale. Um, 
In the ancient ritual of preparing idols to be receptacle of the God's presence, an image would be manufactured in a workshop near a canal, a garden-like area, or a temple. And then the idol would be led to the threshold or gate of the temple and then formally set up. At that time, the living essence of the deity would be transferred into the temple statue and given life by the ritual. Though the image was produced by human hands, the gods were seen as the ultimate makers of the image. The cleansing rite enabled the mouth of the image to be opened and to become the conduit through which God spoke. Generally, the ritual activated the image's senses and caused the human senses, smell, taste, seeing, hearing, to become enlivened, so that the image could become both human-like and a representation of the divine. One of the things Bill mentions is how curious that, that this becomes, in many ways, what God does with Isaiah. Isaiah goes to the temple in this heavenly vision. He's in God's throne room. And he is what? Unworthy. His people are unworthy. And what the idols, what people do for idols, God does for Isaiah in what? Cleansing his mouth so that he can become the conduit to God's people. So that he can represent God to the people. One of the things as followers of Jesus we understand and we'll talk about next week, we, when we follow Jesus, we follow the best representation of what God is like. Paul will use language like, Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. And when we follow in the way of Jesus, when Jesus calls us, come follow me. And we live the life that Jesus lives. And we do the things that Jesus does. And we love, forgive, help. We'll talk about all those things next week. As we follow with Jesus, we become shaped and formed back into the image of what God is meant for us to be the whole time. It is the the opposite, but also the cure for idolatry. So the question becomes for us today, what are the gods that we worship and how do they shape and form us in our contemporary society? I want us to think about, when we think about the way of Jesus, the way of God in the world, What are the things that shape us and form us opposite to that? And how do sometimes we, just like Israel did, convince ourselves to begin with it's okay? But over time, the more we do, when Jesus shows up in our lives, when God's Word comes to our lives, we can't hear it, we can't see it, and we can't understand it. I want us to think about what are some of those things, and um, I'll let y'all talk. I know our time's almost up since uh, they told us we got to be done by seven, but we don't have to. It's a, it's a, it's a flexible schedule. Y'all probably need to go at seven <laughs> with the kids. But um, what, what are some things when you think about you know, this idea of becoming like what you worship? How do we as followers of Jesus sometimes... Isaiah is speaking to God's people. You know, a lot of times we want to point to people outside the church or outside the faith and say, that's what happens. But Isaiah speaks to God's people, being shaped and formed outside of the image of God, to the image of their idol. How do we sometimes fall into that same trap? And what are some of the things that we can do? We'll talk next week about how are we shaped and formed back into the image of Christ through proper worship. So how do we, what are some of the things that you see in our lives, the life of the church, that, that cause us sometimes to be blind and deaf and hard-hearted? I think the thing that makes a lot of us aware of, of <clears throat> as, you, as you get older, I'm the only one here, so that makes a difference, 
is that uh, life comes and goes in your youth and you don't recognize the gifts until there's a crisis. And then you decide that you're unworthy. Mm. But you see other people that seem to have joy in life. Mm. I don't think you want to make idols of them, but you want to find out where they get this joy. And there's usually a group of them, and if they're your age, uh, you try to befriend them or, or uh, get to know them better, or they, then they'll invite you in the group. Might be, uh, in my case, it was a, a, a Bible study at church. The uh, situation was that uh, I was taking engineering physics, <laughs> wasn't my major. Uh, <clears throat> math was very hard. Uh, Cuba was being invaded. Draft was hanging right over you. Uh, but, and so fear was in your mind and it will lock you down. But you want to know what they had. How come they had joy? How come mm -hmm. they didn't feel fear? And uh, you didn't make an idol of that, but because the idol was the fear. Yeah. And uh, of course, good things came of that. Yeah. Uh, it took years and years and years, but you accumulate things like that. I, I don't think you're a hyper religious person right off the bat. That's scary. But uh, uh, it just comes piece by piece by piece. But you can make that fear or that uh, disease or that trauma, whatever it is, the idol in your life that controls you. And you become that. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, you're like a caged animal at that time. And you will mm -hmm. do what it takes you think to survive. But I think that's one thing we in this world, we find things that that uh, we make an idol to get out of that situation, it's a temporary thing. Yeah. But whatever it is. Like, today we had a water leak next to the house, so they come out there and they they mark off the lines where my cable is, and they then they proceed to dig it up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then I called Spectrum, and all of a sudden the numbers changed, and they said, well, if you'll pay your bill right now, we'll give you a 48% discount. Is that a scam? Well, yes it is, because y'all have been scammed. Fear. <coughs> and uh, then you call up uh, the waterworks and say, oh, yeah, we know it. But yeah. the thing is, that's a separation all of a sudden. Where's your crisis? Mm -hmm. You still have that fear. We never get our lips really clean. Yeah. Because fear has always been there and that kind of controls. And, and one of the things, you know, I think fear is probably an idol that that we do it's a way of control. Um, and it's it's something that oftentimes shapes and forms us. And one of the things I've learned in my life, but also through history and through theology, is that fear, once it permeates you, it usually doesn't lead to just being afraid. It leads to anger and it can lead to hate. And what that does is it shapes and forms you to look at neighbor differently than if you ask the question that First John poses, is there true... Is is there fear in love? That sacrificial love that God gives us in Christ, that agape love. And First John would say there is no fear in love. Meaning, you cannot let fear be the thing that shapes and forms you because if you do, you begin to look at neighbor differently than the way that Jesus would look at neighbor. You know, Jesus is able to love neighbor even with the possibility it will hurt me. Even with the possibility of violence, even with the possibility of rejection. You know, and fear is often something that is sold in our, our culture because guess what? I mean, you watch the nightly news. 
Um, there's good things going on in the world. They just don't what? Don't talk about them. They don't, they don't, that doesn't sell. That doesn't sell at all. So fear is oftentimes a motivation to get people to do what you want them to do. To buy what you want them to buy. I mean, we pay a lot of insurance, don't we? That's based on fear. You know, I'm, I've been paying nationwide since I moved here for 14 years. Not ever had, I kind of want something to happen just so I can get a claim from them. Get a few dollars back maybe. I don't know. <laughs> just to make sure this thing's working. <laughs> you know, I, bet, I mean, that's something we do. Uh, it's, they just jack it up, I know. Get back what they gave you. Yeah. But it's, you know, but for good or bad, oftentimes, you know, there are reasons that you should be, you know, proper fear is okay. I mean, you know, that fight or flight instinct, there's there for a reason. But, but it shouldn't be the thing that begins to shape and form the way you view others. The way you think about others. The way you treat others. Because oftentimes when you do that, you begin to see them not in the same image of God that you were created. You see them as something else. Um, any other thoughts y'all have? Are you saying the fear of your health issues? No, no not necessarily health issues. I'm talking about just in general. Yeah. So, you know, if... Um, we'll give an example. Um, if you think your neighbor is there to hurt you or harm you, you know, in Nazi Germany, your neighbors that have been there for years and years and years, you know them, now you think they're a threat. When they are taken on a train, you turn the other way. When you don't hear from them for months, you don't, you, you've used fear to essentially turn your face around on your neighbor. And that's an example from the last hundred years. Oh, I've got good ones. Yeah. I mean, in Inman, South Carolina, in, you know, pre civil rights movement, I mean, you had separate schools. Your neighbor, you treated differently based on an assumption and a fear that there was a reason you had to what? You had to separate. I mean, that's not based on the, the gospel of Jesus. It's based on a culture that creates a sense of there's a reason for it. And it's always based on either I'm going to lose something or they're going to take something from me. And most of the time, it's not real. Just because it's not real doesn't mean you're not going to let it shape and, and control you. I said this in our <clears throat> Sunday school class, but you know, I was trying to live more godly and more intentional. I was on the other side of town, this black guy limping down the road, you know, just looked like he needed a ride. So I picked him up. And I picked him up and he had some kind of speech thing, like he couldn't understand what he was saying. It was like really kind of uncomfortable. And so anyways, he points me and I finally get into you know where his house is and then he kind of pulls his shirt up like this, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this dude's going to pull a gun on me, and he's like, you know, like, what in the world are you, but all this to say, it was, it turned into a fearful situation for me, and one that I think has prevented me from doing that again. Yeah. And it's yeah. supposed to be fear, the Lord's beginning of wisdom, you know, yeah. that's where the fear is, I guess, supposed to be, but yeah. it has shaped me now, Yeah. I, I don't want to do that. Yeah, and, and oftentimes the trauma of something can shape and form us to view everything through that lens. Um, and it takes a lot of hard work to get out of that. Um, I mean, it really does. Um, well, I'm glad y'all were here tonight. I hope that you'll reflect this week, you know, as you watch the news, as you spend your money, as you watch your television shows and read your books and magazines. Ask the question, how is what I'm hearing and seeing and doing shaping and forming me? And ask deep down the question, imagine Jesus is with you and saying, am I being shaped and formed like you or away from you? Are these things creating within me uh, a love of neighbor, humility, self-sacrifice? 
or is it creating in me something else? And we'll talk about uh, formation in the likeness of Christ next week as we look at some of Paul's writings. Um, let me close this in prayer, and um, I'll let y'all skedaddle. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the prophet Isaiah who spoke to a people long, long ago. But God, if we're honest, the people then are just like us now. We want to worship you, but we live in culture that oftentimes shapes and forms us to go opposite your way. Help us, Lord, to recognize in our own lives before we point the finger at others, where we need to reshape and reform and refocus our worship back to you. And God, in worshiping you, may you shape us and form us to be the people you created us to be in the beginning. Guide us, direct us, and bring us back together. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.